Um, it's just to uh, highlight, I think uh, the chairperson have already mentioned where am I. I will just go straight to the presentations. This is the outline of the presentation. It's short, straight to the point. And um, we start there, we'll finish with the way forward. Now, what do we do into the public service? We are responsible for, this is part of the HR, the DPSA is the HR of government. And um, part of those one, there are some legislations that govern us to execute our mandate. So within these um, programs, we have got a, um, a wellness program for the government employees. And then in these wellness programs, we, we have got a strategical framework, which it was developed in 2018. And then it was also being revised three times. The latest revised was in 2018. And in this particular framework, we have got four policies that governs the employee health and wellness program in government, which is the HIV STI and TB management. This is in line with the NSP for the country, that we are part of the sector into the SANAC. So when the SANAC go and sit down, and then it get uh, led by the DP, deputy president, we represent what is happening in government in terms of the HIV management in the workplace. And so far, I think we have been less than 2% infection rate in the government for many years. So which shows that uh, the program is working and people are accessing their treatment and the virus is going down. And then we have got the health and productive management policy. This policy, I normally take it if this is a th third, it's a tertiary preventions program. When we have failed to implement the HIV-1, and then we have fails for the wellness program management and we fail with the shake, then this particular employee will fall into the HPM because we do not de dismiss anybody in government based on HIV infections or any other conditions uh, un unless you, you choose to do it, but you cannot be dismissed. So these are the four programs that we are rendering in governments. And then the one that I'm here for, for the mental health, how do we govern the mental health in governments? It will fall under the HPM and the wellness management programs. All what it has been discussed, I think, from day one until today, it's fall within this particular program. Now, the mandates. What, what we are doing, we are being mandated to do based on these legislations. So this is the highlights that uh, we need to talk about that. Normally the employers or some of the accounting officers, they take the wellness program as a by the way program until we present this to them. And then they understand that they've got a responsibility to make sure that every employee in, under their supervision, it's well and productive. Um, I think yesterday it was Kumo that she was talking about when there are employees who will be referred to get some rehab treatment, they don't have any problems with the government, the departments, because these are the mandates that actually allow them to assist that particular employees to be assisted until you come back and become functional. And then to, we talk about the constitutions that compel us to say everyone has the rights for environment that is not harmful. That's where we take our mandate. And then we go down into chapter 10 of the constitutions that gave us the DPSA. This is the DPSA as the HR of government. That um, it have got the responsibility that um, the public administration has to be accountable. How do you become accountable? Um, one point that uh, Hotoshi was saying, we become accountable for the well-being of our employees, that when they need an assistance, we are there for them. And then when they need to be referred, we do not stop their salaries. When they need to be guided against, we still push them until, if they cannot be functional, they will go into the process of pillar, whereby you will be medical boarded out. So we take care of our employees. 
And then I think today we have got 1.4 million employees, which we are taking care of. And then the public service needs to, people's needs must be responded to. We do respond to all needs. I normally, when I do the presentation into the council for where salaries are negotiated, I will say that we are taking care of your needs because we will take care that we make sure that sometimes you get some um, pay progressions. Hi, I, I, you are also contributing to our stress because we never received an increment. <laughs> okay, so, so, so even during this time of COVID, no government employee will say the salary was cut out because we are really taking care, responding to your needs. And then in terms of the PSA, PSA is the Public uh, Service Act. The Minister for Public Service and Administration has been given eight responsibilities into that particular act. Amongst those eight, there are two that I'm talking about it which are relevant to this meeting. That uh, we are responsible for the well-being, the health and wellness of government employees, 1.4 million. And then we are also take of the labor relations and the condition of services and other employment practices in terms of your well-being. This is actually was alluded yesterday by Kumo and the others. And, and even in terms of, I think Kumo yesterday, she talked about the aftercare. Even in terms of the aftercare, when you are back, I think it was two of the colleagues here who said, some of the employee, especially senior managers, when they were sent for rehab, and then they come back and they become worse, then they will be dismissed. So the labor relations, uh, it protects those people that before we can reach to a point that we can really dismiss you, our supervisors, they become part of this, your aftercare, because we have got the wellness programs in, in government whereby the EAP, the employee health practitioners, they will have a negotiations to with the supervisors that this particular employee is from rehab. Uh, this is what probably will need from the support from yourself. And then don't, you don't need to be too harsh in terms of deliverables. Let's guide him. So there will never a point whereby, unless you are beyond repair, you can be dismissed. But it's very rare in us. We take care of you because these are the, the acts that govern us that we need to take care of yourself. And then furthermore, we are saying we have got the regulations, the public service regulations. Remember, we start with the constitutions and then we come into the, um, the chapter 10 that actually talk about who, what is DPSA and then we go into the public service act that is actually execute the mandate of the MPSA. Now we are coming to the public service regulations. So amongst that particular regulations, we have got regulations 53, 54, and 55. Then 53, it talks about each department shall establish and maintain the health and safety of employees. That is including the mental health. Now, how do we talk about making sure that the environment is safer? Remember, I said the DPSA is the HR of government. So we take care of 156 departments, supporting them in terms of implementing all these HR policies. Now, let's take it as now we are talking about the environment to be healthy and safer. If there is any school in South Africa that there is a learner who is being taught under a tree it means the accounting officer of that particular department, that means the head of departments in the basic education in that particular province or nationally, including the principal of that particular school. If a tree can fall under any learner, that particular teacher who was there must make sure that no tree fall under that particular child because of this act it protect anyone. Does it make sense? <laughs> because this act is protecting that the environment should be healthy and safer for the employees and the service users. 
This is what our framework talks about it. So the service users is not particular. It's you and your relatives and your beneficiaries who are going there. That when you enter our space, whether you go to home affairs, you go to correctional centers, you go to SAPS, your well-being, it will be catered because you are the user. So we make sure that our environment, it should be safer when you are in our care. This is what it means. Then Regulation 54, it talks about promoting that every government department shall have a policy for employee health and wellness. That is, and I'm explaining it. And then we talk about the OHS, that uh, section eight, that talks about the safety. Now, coming down into the... Um, In addition, the Health Act, okay, before I come there. So if, if we, we, we again capacitate our managers in terms of the mental health, that uh, if, how do you give support to an individual who, because you know, when you talk about mental health, it started very less. Um, it will start with your frustrations in terms of executing our duties. If you cannot manage that frustration well, it will lead you into a stress. And a prolonged stress, it will lead you into depressions. And a prolonged depression is not managed well, then it will lead you into mental health conditions. Now, once you are into the mental health conditions, therefore you sometimes lose your rights your rights become limited because you will be actually admitted into an institution. So once you get into that particular institutions like your vescopies, your Sterfontein, I don't know others in KZN and other provinces because I work here. Now the moment once you get there, then the mental health attitude will kick in to protect you, then you, you lose some of your rights because you are there. Now, when I was a student, we were prepared when we were doing this abnormal psychology. We were prepared for almost a year before you go and work into the psychiatric institution. And then one of the lessons that we were told is to say, every behavior has a meaning and it communicates something. <laughs> Does it make sense? Yes. So every behavior has a meaning and it's communicating something. Now, if you are a manager and you are in the workplace and you see one of your employees, uh, they come to work wearing differently according to their expectations. That behavior is communicating something to you. Does it make sense? Because if you're going to work, you are expected to dress well, to be relevant to the environment where you're working. Regardless of the policies, we don't need to spend much time about the policies that say how many centimeters above the knee, how many centimeters below the knee. It's not, <laughs> it's not actually helping us. You need to wear in a comfortable way that is actually represent yourself and it can also represent your employer because we don't give you uniform. But there are other departments that they get uniforms, like your SAPs, your, SA, uh, your correctional centers. I see some of the home affairs, they do get it. And all departments of health, they get actually some stipends to buy. So those ones are already regulated. But the majority of government employees, you don't. So we expect you to wear that when the service users, they are coming into your care, they should not actually query the type of services that you are going to give by the way you are dressing. Does it make sense? Yes. yes. So now, in terms of this mental, the every behavior has a meaning and it communicates something. It was because they were preparing us that if we go to those institutions and the patients there beat us, we can't go to court. Because these people that are in this environment and their rights are limited, and then they are protected. So if they were aware of the environment, they wouldn't be there. So we were trained that you're going to use your bean to be a therapeutic person to this person, bring this person into the reality that this is Mr. So-and-so. 
Because some of them, they will be calling themselves, I'm President de Klerk, I'm President Mandela, or I'm so and so, and then you don't need to judge them. So you keep on letting them and you help them. So all those teachings, we bring them into capacitating our managers in the workplace to be able to see that if an employee coming here wearing like he's going to look after cows and donkeys, then there's something wrong. And under normal circumstances, I will say, I'm not being a sexist, but uh, once a woman wear a high heel, there is an expectation of the movement that you're going to wear, <laughs> that you're going to take that movement because of the high heel that you're wearing. If you do not respect your high heel, you're going to be injured. <laughs> okay? So, so it tells you that if you see, like if you're wearing your high heel and you are running, it communicates to us that it must be something urgent that she's running after or she wants to do something. Okay? But under normal circumstances, then, then, then you started to see any person and then with the high waking like this in the police force. It also tells you something. Like there must be something wrong with this one. So now as an employer, you must be able to ask yourself, uh, uh, but this movement is not normally uh, to this gentleman or to this particular uh, lady. Then you must be able to go and say, but uh, is everything fine? Sometimes they will disclose, sometimes they may not. Or sometimes they said, yes. Not everything is fine because of your attitude towards me. <laughs> Does it make sense? So why? Because all these acts, they are giving you a space to be protected into the workplace. So our policies does not isolate anyone. So if there is somebody who has been admitted and come back, there must be that particular communications with the manager in order to assist with the aftercare so that this person might be able to be productive. And then we should not use your performance, poor performance related to your, well, your health, and then we make you that you are not productive. That is not supposed to be. Okay. And then um, in um, other mandate, we talk about um, the Health Care Act, we do put it in. Now, what we are saying about that one, we are saying the adequate resources should be made available for education and training for all the practitioners. So our EHW should be capacitated in order to, to be able to be productive and to be able to assist the employees to be healthy in the workplace. So now, the resources, it's meant for, I think this one, it's assist, is it Komoto? Mm. The one from yesterday? Yes. Yeah, it assists her that she must get the resources so that she must have all those people where they will be referred to. Mm -hmm. And then when they are there, she must make sure that maybe they may not get a bacon and egg, but maybe they will get something similar. Because there will be the, the dietitians who will come and look upon the nutrition. But to us, because we are government, and then we do not appoint the underage people, <laughs> okay? So we make sure that we fundraise you, we, we sponsor you, we meet you halfway through GEMS, we subsidize you so that you can get the best care where you can. And then we make sure again we, we subsidize you to get a home, have a place of stay which is well-being, which is actually well accommodated. And then to, in Mental Health Act also, it says provision of mental health services at all levels of care. We are saying in the workplace, there must be, like I said to you, that I think it's Section 50, it's Regulation 54, that says every accounting officer in government shall make sure that there is a policy for wellness. So now, that one, that the provisions of all levels of care, said even in the workplace, they shall be the management of mental health in the workplace through the EHW programs. Then we promote and improvise the mental status of populations, including the workplace. So as I said that we have got 1.4 million government employees. And, and actually, even this time for COVID, when we were taking care of the people during COVID, we found that it is less than 10% of the government employees who were infected by COVID. And we have got less than 1% of death. Because when we were responding, it, our policies make sure that it responds, we promote uh, 
remote waking, waking. And currently we are busy developing the policy for working remotely beyond COVID so that we might be able to understand and assist people, our, our employee in terms of that they should be have minimal stress of their COVID related. They don't need to be depressed, but although there were depressions and some of the some healthcare system or well-being that it were affected because some of you, some of the employees, they have lost their loved one. Therefore, there was availability of psychosocial interventions to them, even if they were at home. And then we are saying the SDG, we do also support the SDG uh, 2030 in terms of ensuring the well-being of our employees in terms of the mental health. Now, these are, I'm not going to read upon it. Um, the, the presentation is there. But this is what is happening into the DOH frameworks in terms of management of, of mental health. Then the implementation challenges that we found it into government, we found that there is an insufficient capacity to manage the, the mental health in the workplace because out of 156 departments, not all practitioners are professional. You may find that there is somebody who is just a coordinator. This person is not well trained, a social worker, psychologist, or psychiatric nurse, or psychiatric doctor. Therefore, they may not be able to provide this care. But this person is working as a coordinator. So that means in that particular department, they will have outsources, outsource the, the, their services to a service provider whereby when you need an assistance, you can coordinate with this person telephonically, you can get your counseling and all those things. So this is part of the challenges that we are looking that we need to professionalize it instead of having these coordination things, we need to get the real people who are well trained that they will provide in all those departments that they do not have it. And then we need actually to appoint the correct people, uh, coordinators versus practitioners. So we need to look on those things. And then lack of disclosure by employees. Not every employees who have got a psychiatric or a mental illnesses can go and disclose. The reason being probably they are fearing that they will be discriminated. But the environment, it is conducive that they should not be discriminated by their supervisors. Because our HR policies, they protect them against any abuse, either by the supervisor or by the colleague. So, and the moment when you disclosed, um, you are in a position to be placed. Sometimes you might be, find yourself depressed because of you are not able to produce. There is a pressure in your work. And then if you cannot disclose it, it means now your problem is won't be solved because you will remain in that particular environment. Therefore, but if you are going to disclose and there will be a communications between your healthcare provider, your practitioner, and the employer, there is a possibility that you can be shifted from where you are and then become productive somewhere. I'm not saying it's, I'm saying there is a possibility. And the way forward this is I say that we shall capacitate our people, we shall appoint the correct people, we shall train, and then the statutory body registration should be utilized as during the employment. When USA you want a EHW practitioner, make sure that you request that this person must have a statutory body. That means now you are trying to get rid of the coordinators and you are getting the well people who are trained and then they shall provide a professional services. And thank you, we belong, we care, and we serve.